So we're in the middle of our series uh, called The Comeback, and uh, just great stories as we head into what season's next? Easter, all right? And so we thought we should talk about, like, some of the top stories about Jesus. And so we're doing some of the top stories about Jesus, and they're just randomly picked because we don't think there are less important stories or more important stories. And, and this is the one we chose today. It's out of Matthew 9. And, and here's, before we get there, I just, I just want to give you three different pictures, all right, and three different images, and here's what I want you to know. At one point in time or another, we all relate to one of these, and we all relate to one of them better than another, and, and I just want to give you the opportunity to say, hey, that's me today, that's not me today, uh, and, and here's what I want you to know. Again, we all relate to each one of these at one point in time in our life, in one way or another. And so we're going to start with the one over here on your right. And that's Matthew, the tax collector. He's going to be one of the main characters in our story. And, and here's what I want you to know about Max Cle Matthew, the tax collector. And again, I just want you to kind of visually assume the posture. I'm sorry for the artistic rendering. We could have had Terry Lynn do something really cool. But this is my artistic ability right here, stick people. And that, that sometimes exceeds that even for me. All right? And so the, the guy on the far right is Matthew, the tax collector, who in our passage, all right, hears the voice of Jesus responds to the calling of Jesus, and then follows Jesus, all right? And, and the way he responds, you see someone that's contrite, someone that, that's humble, someone that, who maybe even feels lost, who feels overwhelmed, who feels like there's no way anybody can rescue or care for me today, all right? And so that's Matthew on the right. In the middle, you have Jesus, all right? And what I want you to think about with Jesus is not only is he kneeling down, and the reason he's kneeling down is because he's coming down to Matthew's level. He's not condemning Matthew. He's not saying, you're the worst person in the world. You're a stupid idiot. You are an absolute mess. Instead, Jesus says, I'm going to kneel down to your level. And Jesus' goal isn't to make Matthew feel bad. Because when we confront the Almighty God, that already happens. Like, we all suddenly go, whoa, I, I am I'm a mess. Right? We sing an amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. We, we, we even sing... Uh, uh, what a wretch. Like who? Two of you know the song. Good. Excellent. All right. The rest of you that don't know it, the lyrics are a wretch like, he found a wretch like me, okay? And, and so, again, when we're confronted with Jesus, suddenly who we are and our in inability to be holy, is, is, it's, it's well known. And so Jesus is reaching down not to make us feel bad, but he comes down to our level. But most importantly, I want you to see this. Jesus goes to Matthew and meets him where he's at. Okay? And so, in our story, we could be Matthew today, all right? And, and we reflect on times when we've, we've been Matthew. And then in our story, we could say, hey, are, are we much more like Jesus today? Am I going to behave like Jesus this week is the question that we're going to ask you as we close our service. This week, will you act more like Jesus? Uh, or, again, the final person in our story is the people too holy to help. You know anybody too holy to help? All right? And I kind of, like... You know, they're looking down. This isn't the Superman pose. This is the I'm looking down on you. I tried to find someone with crossed arms like this, but I couldn't do it. And then the one I found, that guy looked too cool. So I couldn't, it just couldn't pull it off. All right? And so this is someone that's too holy to help. All right? And this is the person that's indignant and even bothered by the presence of others. It's like the anti-Mother Teresa. It's the person that goes to church, is probably a church leader, sings the loudest and amazing grace, but has forgotten the part <coughs> where they sing that once was lost. They look down on everybody else. Why? Because they love Jesus so much more than everybody else, and they know that Jesus loves them more than everybody else, right? And the person, they're not going to tell you or insult you to your face. It's going to be their body language, right? Because they're, they, they're smart enough to not just say and talk to you in front of your face. They're going to they're do it behind your back, right? And then they're going to talk about, you know what? A Christian wouldn't do that. No. They wouldn't wear those clothes. They wouldn't watch those movies. You know, someone who loves Jesus only reads the KJV Bible. Right? Right? And then someone who loves Jesus, they don't see those types of movies. No, they do not. Right? And someone who loves Jesus, they wouldn't have those big holes in their ears. That's how you know someone doesn't love Jesus. They couldn't get holy with Jesus, so they had to make their ears holy. Come on, that was pretty good. I, I thought that was good. <laughs> yeah, and then they got all 
all these things about if you love Jesus, you don't, you don't, you don't behave this way, you don't smoke, you don't drink. You know what? Women are only supposed to wear dresses. Men, they don't ever cut their hair and they have to wear certain things. And, and, and in churches, you know what? Only these people can speak. Only these people can do this. And, and they got all these rules. And by the time they're done with these rules, what we know is you can identify according to the person too holy to help. You can identify the people who love Jesus the most, all right, because they're the most unhappy people you'll ever meet. And they don't look at all like the Jesus I read about in Scripture. Instead, they look like somebody else I read about in Scripture. Because when I read about Jesus, and until Jesus gets to the cross or until he's praying for the world, Jesus seems like a pretty jovial guy. In fact, Jesus has a reputation for hanging out with who? The drunkards and the sinners, and he always seems to be at a party. That's what the, in fact, Jesus says, look, you're upset with John the Baptist because he's too pious, and then you're upset with me because I'm always at a party. Can you guys get happy? I'll never forget my grandmother at uh, <clears throat> my cousin Phil's wedding. Uh, uh, she stood up, and again, my grandma dated Moses, so you know she's holy, all right? First of all, to live that long, you know you had to do something right. All right? And uh, so she stood up and gave the, the prayer at the wedding reception. And she said, I just want everybody in this room to know. And she always talks loud because she can't hear anyways. She said, I just want everybody in this room to know Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. Because the party was about to stop. And God said, let us party on. And I thought for a moment I wanted to do like Wayne and God's like, yeah, party on. And I just, but I knew my grandma had never seen it, so it wouldn't make sense to her. All right, so, so you got these, these three images, okay? Matthew, the tax collector, I, man, I don't deserve you, Jesus. I, I come in, I'm burdened, I'm overwhelmed. And, and, and here's just what I want you to know. You may come in the day like that person, and that's okay. You may come in the day going, I've been Jesus this past week. Give me high fives. And you can turn to the person beside you and give them a high five. And if they're not paying attention, just smack them upside the head. It's okay. Right? And, and, and you may come in the day and you may go, I know that person on the right. I know the person too holy to help. But before you start throwing rocks at them, I just want you to know that we've all been there. We've all looked at someone who's doing something and going, oh my goodness. Someone who loves Jesus would never fill in the blank. And whether or not you know it, somebody's looked at you like that. Whether or not you know it, somebody's looked at you like that. In fact, you may be here today, and we, we like to jokingly, but it's true, call ourselves the church for recovering church people. Like if you've been burnt at a church, we like to say, hey, we're not into religion, we're into Jesus here. All right? and, and, and you may be here today because you were toasted at some other place where some of the stuff we've joked about was preached to you as the gospel. Like, you know what? That, that, no, that was true, Aaron. But you couldn't do, and you couldn't do, you couldn't do, and you couldn't do, and by the time we were done, we couldn't do anything when we went to our church except show up at church. And I just want you to know, I just want you to know that, that again, it, it's okay for you to go, I know that person, but before you start throwing rocks, I just want you to know that somebody else sees you like that. Sees you like that because why? Because you're in here today. And you crossed the line where you, be, you became, in someone's perception, that person. And so our goal is that how do we continue to become more like the guy in the middle? All right? And so here's our scripture, Matthew 9. If you want to get on your e-vice uh, with us, uh, the uh, hashtag today, I believe, is follow, is it follow me, guys? Yep, follow me. Uh, so if you want to get on your e-vice to pull up the scripture, uh, feel free to do so. This is, what, <clears throat> this is how it reads. Uh, I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to talk about it. It goes like this. Uh, Jesus went from there. Now, there is a previous story in Matthew 9 that connects to this one, but we don't have time to climb into it all. But just know that you know, your homework is to read the previous story to know where he came from. All right? Jesus went on from there, saw a man named Matthew. Now, pause. Now, this is really cool. Because if you're reading this or hearing me say that right now, and you go, Matthew, Matthew, that sounds familiar. Matthew, Matthew. There's a Matthew in my third grade class, but that's not it. Who's Matthew? Who's Matthew? If you're reading that, and all of a sudden you look in your phone, and you go, oh, wait, Matthew's the guy who wrote the book I'm reading. That's because that's what happened. This is the very guy who's writing the book you're reading. This is, listen to this. This is the very first my story ever. How cool is that? It, he didn't even put a hashtag on it. All right, this is the very first my story ever. Matthew is sharing his firsthand account of what happened with Jesus. And he's writing the entire story. And here's one of the reasons why we go, you know what? This is a great defense for the Bible. Because none of the disciples write about themselves in a way that makes them look intelligent. In fact, if you and I were to ever write a story, we would write it about ourselves. And we would always try to make ourselves look smarter than we are. 
all right, which for me would take a lot of like ad lib and rewriting of my life, okay? But Matthew and the disciples always write about themselves, and we always walk away going, man, these guys were really dumb. All right, why? Because they're giving you, this is how it was. They're not exaggerating it at all. And so Matthew is writing a firsthand account. This is one of the reasons why we believe, why we trust the story, because we go, Matthew, the guy who's in the story, wrote the story. And he's a villain in the story. Watch it. Matthew was sitting, what's he doing? He's collecting taxes. Now, I know we're getting about to April here, and some of you are thinking about taxes, and you don't like taxes, but we don't relate to this at all, because in, the, in, in Jesus' time, the tax collector was the super villain, all right? It was the Lex Luthor of all villains, okay? Some of you relate. Some of you are like, Who the, who's Lex? All right, wait. All right, now, here's what I want you to know, all right? In the Scripture, they have special language to describe certain sins. They have sinners, which is like kind of everybody, and then they have prostitutes, because they're really bad people, and then they have killers and murderers, because they're really bad people too, and then they have another category that's like the worst of the worst, and it is the word that they use for tax collectors, because they're, they're like eviler than than prostitutes and killers, then you have tax collectors. That's how bad these dudes are. Why? Because they're always robbing their own people. All right? They're stealing from their own people. They're traitoring their own people. They're the guy who says, hey, you don't have enough money. Take his daughter. All right? So that's how bad these dudes are. This is the worst of the worst. All right? And so Matthew is a tax collector sitting at the tax collector's booth. He is in the process of committing sins in our story. All right? And Jesus walks up to the tax collector's booth and says to Matthew, follow me. Matthew gets up and he follows him. Scripture goes on and says this. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, so we move some time forward, and Jesus is now having dinner at Matthew's house. Uh, and by the way, they were having a gluten-free pizza. All right? It's unknown, but that's what was going on from uh, Donato's in there, I think. All right? And so when Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and they ate with him, Matthew and Jesus, and his disciples. And then I love it. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors? Now here's what I love, all right? What I love about this is, remember, this is God, right? And so the Pharisees, they're like, they don't want to talk straight to God because this is the church meeting that goes on in the parking lot after the meeting when they don't really want to confront who's ever really in charge. We don't know what that's like at all, do we? Like, you've never been at any church, any organization, at your job where no one really wanted to go and confront the boss. They wanted to talk about that person behind the back. Look, all that stuff's biblical, all right? And, and, and so, so they don't really want to confront Jesus, so they go, eh, let's grab one of us. Hey, Pete, 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 come here, Peter, Peter, yeah. Why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors? Shh, 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 shh. We don't want Jesus to hear us. Now, uh, first of all, this is, uh, it's God, right? So he hears everything, right? Amen? All right? And, and whether we want him to or not, he hears, like, Jesus doesn't have to be in the same room. He's hearing you, right? He's like, you know, you got mom with super hearing. Jesus is like even better than that. Okay, in fact, I don't even know if Jesus audibly heard it or because he's God, he just knew what they were saying, all right? It says that Jesus, Jesus got superpowers, he heard this. This is why we tell you, if you're mad with God, just tell him. Why? Because he already knows anyways. He's already heard it. Even before you say the word, Jesus hears it out of your heart. And it's okay to be mad with God, right? It's okay to be upset with God. Just, just be honest with God. Because why? Jesus says, I don't want anything to, to hinder that relationship. I don't want any sin to come between us. All right? And Jesus hears what they say. And it says, on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor. And everybody nodded their head. Yep, yep. Sick, sick people, right? Sick people. They need a doctor. But the sick who need a doctor. And then Jesus says, but listen, you idiots. Now, Matthew made it pretty PC here, okay? All right, but I'm telling you, that's what Jesus said. All right, he said, listen, you idiots. All right, and any of you that don't think that's what Jesus said, all right, you're starting to lean over into the too holy to help category. I'm just telling you how it is, okay? All right, and Jesus said, listen, you idiots, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, those of you too good to help, but I've come for the, who? All right, real quick, real quick, just so we're all on track with who that would be, all right? If you're perfect, I need you to raise your hand right now. 
No? All right. If you fall into the category of sinners of any kind, just go ahead and raise your hand now. All right. If your neighbor does not have their hand up, you need to smack them in the face and tell them they're going to hell for lying. All right. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Now, here's what I want you to do. i got to give you a challenge. I want you to forget that you know the whole story. Okay, forget it. All right, I know we just read it to you, but, but now I want you to go, all right, I don't know what's coming next. Okay? And because I think if we, if we cheat and we know what's coming next, we miss some of the awe oh, moments of the story. All right, you ready? So this is what happens. All right, there's a guy named Matthew. He's a tax collector. All right? And you see him kind of writing out this book, and his kids gather around him and say, Daddy, 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 what are you doing? And he says, I'm telling the stories about Jesus. I'm writing them out so that the future generations know it. And, and they say, Daddy, 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 tell us to us again. Tell us what you're writing about. And he says, okay, I it's my favorite story. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. It's about when Jesus found me. Oh, no, Daddy, we like that one. We like that one. Tell us about it, all right? And, G- and Matthew begins to tell him. He says, look, I was a tax collector. And even his own kids are like, ooh, Daddy, you were a bad dude. Ooh, no, 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 no. You were like, like the Lone Ranger needed to come and shoot you. Yes, Daddy, you were a bad dude, okay? And, and he says, look, I was a tax collector. And he says, I was sitting at the table collecting taxes. I was committing the offenses. And then Jesus came into town walking because Jesus didn't ride horses not a western even though i'd like it to be all right and jesus came walking into town and he said there i was sitting there collecting taxes and then jesus looked at me with those eyes remember you don't know the rest of the story okay you got it if you're cheating it's no good two points are subtracted from you if you're cheating you do not know the rest of the story and jesus looked at me with those eyes and i knew what he was thinking because i had heard about jesus I had heard he was this holy man. He, he made the blind to see and made the lame to walk and fed 5,000 people with a happy meal and thought about opening a franchise. And I, I just knew about this Jesus guy. And I knew, I knew that he was this holy guy. And when he looked at me, his gaze was like penetrating. Like he was looking into my heart and I could just feel my insides just boiling over. And I, I thought, oh dear God, I'm, I'm, I'm collecting taxes. I'm a, I'm a tax collector. I am the worst of the sinners in all town. And, and, he, and, and I, I, I had no to hide. I would sit at this table and I had Roman soldiers around me and, and I looked to my left and I looked to my right and I looked back hoping that Jesus wasn't looking at me anymore and he was still staring at me. And I knew what he was thinking. How many of you showed up at church like that sometime? Right? How many of you have not, you don't have to raise hands because I know it's Come on, we, some of us haven't even come to church because of what we did it that week, right? Like we were so guilty and felt so bad about what we did that week. Because let's be honest, okay? Just honesty check, all right? I don't be, misbehave on the week and think the first place I need to go is church, right? That's not what I do. I don't go, oh man, I screwed up this week. I can't wait for Sunday when we get to go to church, right? I think maybe I should miss this Sunday. Because I know when I get to church, the person sitting on my left and right, they're perfect. Right? And then I sit there, and I am as unholy and unclean. I am the evildoer between everybody that's perfect. And I look around me, and I can just, I, I mean, I look up at the cross on Sunday morning. I can just see Jesus' eyes peering into my soul. And he's going, I know what you did. And I start thinking of Jesus is like Santa Claus. Like, you better not shout. You better not cry. I know what you did. And I'm coming to get you. Right? That's just how we feel sometimes, right? Now, this is huge. This is important. Why? Because this, this, this is the part of the story that I absolutely love. And the part of the story that we often overlook when we read the passage is, is that Jesus does what then? He doesn't look at Matthew, right? And wait for Matthew to come to him, right? He doesn't stand in the town center and be like, boy, get over here. Right? That's not what Jesus does. What does Jesus do? Jesus goes to Matthew, right? Now, this is huge because this changes how we should function as a church. If we're going to be the guy in the middle of the, the stick men people, right? If we're going to be like Jesus, we have to be the person that goes to the people who already feel like we're condemning them. 
We have to go to a world that says, you hate me because you love Jesus, and I don't behave the way I should, therefore I don't want anything to do with you. We can't go, yeah, you're right, I don't want anything to do with you, stay over there. We have to go be a part of their lives. We have to intervene, we have to intermix with these people who feel like the church hates them, who feel like when they encounter someone who loves Jesus, they should kneel down, put their head down, and say, take the ax to my neck. We have to be like Jesus who doesn't wait and say, come on, come on. We have to go to them if we're going to be like Jesus. It changes everything for who we are if we're going to behave like Jesus. It changes everything for how we should behave as a church. We use a phrase over and over again to describe the mission of the church. The mission of the church is what? The mission of the church is to move people closer to Jesus. We're going to say that a couple more times in the service. You ready? The mission of the church is to what? Move people closer to Jesus. That was more of a mumble. Let's get it with a more oomph, Ready? The mission of the church is to what? Move people closer to Jesus. Very good. And we say this catchphrase to help us remember. We say, do we miss the most? The people Jesus misses the most. And it's a little awkward to say if you do it real fast. It's a tongue twister. All right? But it helps us remember, do we miss the most the people that Jesus misses the most? Why? Because the mission of the church is to move people closer to Jesus. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we have to go to people. We can't expect them to run to us, which is what some churches do. I don't know why people don't come. Our doors are open. We love Jesus. I don't know why anybody shows up. Why? Because the world is waiting for you to go to them, not them come to us. And Jesus sometimes shakes his head at the church and says, Are you going to act like me or not? Because if you're going to follow me, you're going to behave like me, and you've got to go to people. You've got to go to people. Again, Matthew's sitting there shaking his head. I know what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, you tax collector, you evildoer, you sinner. Don't you know that Christians... Don't you know a Christian, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't struggle with pornography, they don't divorce, they aren't homosexuals, they don't steal paper clips from work, they don't tell lies, they don't watch those shows, they don't read those books, they don't eat at those places, and you and I could add on to that list, right? You've got a list of what Christians don't do that you've heard from somebody, right? And that's why we're all going to hell, right? You've got that list that you've heard. You know someone who's put together a list of rules that have nothing to do with Scripture or what Jesus says as to why we should condemn, why we should be judgmental, why we should criticize the world. But Jesus comes and he does something different. Again, Matthew's sitting at a tax collector's table and you can just see Jesus walking up to him. And in Matthew's mind, it's like the Western showdown. And Jesus is going to come up and blast him upside the head with condemnation, right? And Jesus comes up, and, and here's what I love. You ready? Jesus does not condemn. Now, here, i got to pause. Make sure you don't miss this. Jesus does not condemn, but he also does not condone. You cannot miss this. If you get one thing this morning, this is what the one thing is that you need to walk away from, okay? Jesus does not condemn, but he does not condone. What does that mean? That means that Jesus can accept us as we are, but he can't leave us as we are. Why? Because when we encounter God, when we encounter grace, everything begins to change. If grace does not transform who we are, it isn't real grace. It's just acceptance. And you can get that at a bar. And you will be there every night with the same problem over and over and over and over again but when you encounter grace you don't go back to the bar taking the same problem over and over again when you encounter grace grace begins to change you and you begin to go i am going to be free from that problem from that guilt from that feeling and everything about you begins to be transformed because grace says i love you as you are but i love you enough i will not leave you where you are you're going to become who i created you to be amen Oh, come on. Am I the only one excited about that? Come on now. We sing all these songs about the transformation of God, about what God's doing, about how God will not leave me alone, how God will never let me go, about how God's love is so great that it just says, here's where you are. Yeah, but I'm going to move you over here. Woohoo! Look at this life. You see, we get lost. We think that, that the relationship with Jesus is about heaven. It's about what happens when we die. But it's really about God taking us from where we are now. Going, Woo, look over here. This is so much more fun. That's what life is about. God says, look, I don't, I don't condemn you, but I also don't condone it. And if you're going to choose to follow me, life will be different. You see, grace invites us to change in response to the loving calling of Christ. And so just when you think you have the story figured out, right? Because remember, you don't know what happens next. Jesus has walked up to the table 
And you can feel Matthew like fingernails on the chalkboard thing going on. And he's ready for Jesus to blast him. And he's kind of got his head down. And he's tilted away. And then Jesus says an amazing phrase, right? He says, Matthew. Man, the very fact that Jesus calls him by name. Matthew, come follow me. Oh, Jesus, you don't, you, you don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously I'm a tax collector, but I mean, you, you can't mean that. You know, no, Matthew, I don't even want you to come follow. I, that's not all I want. I want you to, I want, I want to eat at your house tonight. Jesus, hey, listen, yeah, I, I mean, you, you got to know what you're getting into. Matthew, I want you to leave it all behind. And I want you to come follow me. Jesus, I, I, I'm not, again, I just don't think, Matthew, Matthew, listen, listen, I love you so much. I love you so much that even death will not keep me from coming back to save you. Even death upon the cross. I love you so much. You know why, Matthew? Because I am the king of the comeback. You think you're in sin. You think you're down and out. But I am the king of the comeback. I am the king of the comeback. They're going to bury me. They're going to put me on a cross. They're going to bury me in the tomb. And they're going to think, oh, we're done with this Jesus fellow. He can't save anybody else. But I say, Matthew, even death will not keep me from you because I am the king of the comeback, baby. You bring it on, saying we can't handle because I am the king of the comeback. Amen? Jesus invites Matthew to follow him. And our story changes from there on out. Your story changed from there on out, didn't it? If you are here today and you're going, look, I feel the eyes of Jesus speaking to me. I mean, they're looking into my heart and I feel terrible. I feel like I'm guilt ridden. I just want you to know Jesus isn't looking at you to, to, to burn through your heart with hate and condemnation. Jesus is saying to you right now, come follow me. I know Jesus, but I haven't been following you. Jesus, I have this list of excuses to why I shouldn't follow you. Jesus, I have this uh, whole rule written out about why I'm such a terrible person. Just listen, listen, listen. I am the come, king of the comeback of souls. Come follow me is what he's saying to you, to you this morning. And again, he not only invites Matthew to follow him, but he says, I want you to go and have a meal with me. Why? Because he's fulfilling what one day he'll talk about in Revelation 3.20. Jesus says this. Again, you probably have seen this scripture with a painting somewhere. Uh, Jesus says this amazing scripture. Jesus says, behold, which is a word we talk about is underused. Okay, wives, in fact, tomorrow I want you to go home. I want you to walk in the house and go, behold, it is I, the wife. And your husband should respond like, behold, it is you, and run to you. It's a word underused, all right? Behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. What door? Well, the door of your heart, it says. But if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into them. Again, Jesus is saying, I'm going to come in and I'm going to rearrange. I'm at the door of your heart. I will come in and rearrange your life. And then he says this part where we, we read in Matthew and go, oh, you're fulfilling it. And the metaphor it seems to break down a little bit. But he says, I'm going to stand at the door of your heart and knock. And then I'm going to come into your heart. And then I'm going to do what? I'm going to eat with that person and they with me. Why? Because a meal in Jesus' day was the most sacred event you could have. We do communion today as the most sacred event the church does. And that was the precursor. All right, that was part of what would happen at a meal. And Jesus is saying, look, we're going to come and we're going to have communion together. There's going to be a meal that we eat together. Ah, but there's still one stick figure left in our story, isn't there? Mr. Too Holy to Help. Mr. Hands on the Hips looking down on you, right? And we get the Pharisees. And the Pharisees go to Jesus' disciples, and they say to Jesus' disciples, they say, how can your teacher, how can this guy eat with these people? Doesn't he know who he's eating with? Doesn't he know what he's doing? Doesn't he know their stories? Doesn't he know what they did? This is going to ruin Jesus' reputation. And we had him as this holy guy, but from here on out, he's out the door. Here's what I pray for you. I pray for us, church. I pray for, pray, listen, listen, listen very carefully. I pray that our reputation is tarnished as the church who is willing to do the things nobody else is willing to do to reach the people that no one else is willing to reach for Jesus' name's sake. I pray that the town, the city, the entire Dayton area, Ohio, begins to look at Fairborn United Methodist Church and go, well, the real church that loves Jesus wouldn't do that. 
Yeah. Those guys, they don't behave like anybody that's a real church. I pray that the rest of the world begins to say things like that because when we hear those stories about us as individuals and us as a church, then you will know you begin to act like the guy in the middle. You begin to act like Jesus who goes to people doing the things that people say he shouldn't do to reach people that people say he should never reach. What a great reputation, right? And if I can get the reputation where people are like, look, a good pastor wouldn't do that. And I can say to people, yeah, that's right, good pastor wouldn't do that. But I'm not a good pastor. I just want to act like Jesus. Then I've done it. Then I've done it. All right? And this is what Jesus says. He, he makes this amazing statement to these people, too holy to help. He says, listen, listen, you guys don't get it. It's not the healthy that I've come to be with. Like they, 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 you've already got it. You don't need me. I've come to rescue the sin. Now, here we got to pause because this is the reminder that the only way we actually encounter God appropriately is to say, I need you. And if we come to God any other way, we can't follow him. If at some point in time while we're following God, we go, hey, I got it from here on out. I don't need to follow you anymore. Jesus, you missed the turn. All right, my life was supposed to go this way. You keep wanting it to go this way. But you, you missed that turn, Jesus. Right now, is God calling you to do something that you're saying to God? <laughs> we were supposed to go, right, Jesus. Let's stop and have a conversation. I'm telling you, right then, your relationship with Jesus begins to be broken. And Jesus will stand at that turn and say, no, come follow me. I know what I'm, I'm God. Come follow me. Come follow me. Come follow me. And he will be patient and wait for you to get back on course. But if you want to be the director of your own life, your life will go seriously off track. And you will begin to miss out on the joy that Jesus offers you. The excitement that Jesus offers you. All right, so let's wrap it up. We have three different people. We have the too holy to help. And again, we've, we, we've all been there. We've all looked at somebody and said, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're doing that. And instead of going and helping them, we, we kind of walked on by. We have Matthew, the tax collector, who reminds us, look, Jesus didn't come to condemn, but he also doesn't condone. And I have to change and follow him if I'm, gonna, if I'm truly going to be a disciple of Christ. And then we have the great challenge of the church to, what's the mission of the church? To what? Move people closer to Jesus. And in order to do that, we have to miss the most, the people that Jesus misses the most. We have to go to people. And so here's what I want you to think about this week. I want you to choose which one of these three characters you're going to be like this week. Which one of these three, three characters are you going to go, that's who I want to be this week. All right? and, and by the way, <laughs> to do nothing means you're too holy to help. All right? Martin Luther King Jr. said, the greatest sin that humanity commits is often the one where they do nothing. And so to do nothing means that you choose that you're too holy to help. Because you have a friend, you have a neighbor right now who every time they sit with you, they begin to pour out their life to you and you, 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 you refuse to help. And you don't have to sit there and lead them to Jesus at that moment. That's great if you do. But you just need to be a friend. And you need to look for ways to speak to people about the name of Jesus. You need to look for the appropriate ways. Again, we're not talking about jamming Jesus down someone's throat. We're just simply saying, look, there are people who are crying out for help, who are sitting at tax collector's tables right now, waiting for you to intervene on behalf of God in their life, waiting for you to act like Jesus, to go and kneel down in the mud with them and say, I am here as an emissary from God. Waiting for you to be Jesus. Waiting for us as a church to do what Jesus told us to do. So there's your challenge. Which one of the three characters are you going to be this week? I, we don't need to talk about this year. We don't need to talk about this month. Just this week. Which one of these three characters are you going to be? And, and so here's what I want you to do. I want you to begin to pray this morning. Like right now, before you leave, I want you to begin to pray. I want you to pray, God, who is it in my life? that I should be going to because I need to think differently. I need to think differently about that relationship. I need to think about how they need rescue, not by me, but by you, God. 
And I need to share my story of I once was lost, but now I'm found. I need to be able to be there as a friend. I need to be able to care for them. I need to be able to love them. And finally, this week, right now, if you're sitting here and you're going, look, I, I'm not to that point yet. I'm the guy, I'm Matthew. And you know, we'd love to talk to you after the service. We'd love to have you come up to the front of the stage and, and, and some of our band members we would love to just pray for you. I'd love to pray for you after the service. We'd love to just lay hands on you and we'd love to remind you that you are forgiven and free and that Jesus can rescue you. Your life can be a comeback story from sin. If you feel like the eyes of God are upon you and you're like, look, just stop looking, Jesus. I just want you to know that there is hope for you. That Jesus can rescue even you. Amen? I'm going to pray. We're going to invite the band to come up. and We're going to take up our offering. And and we're going to be about done. I'm going to invite you at this moment to be in an attitude of prayer with me. And and I just want to lead you right now. If you are a Matthew, I just want to invite you to pray with me. If you're a Matthew now or you've ever been a Matthew, I just, again, I just want you to just kind of repeat the prayer that I pray this morning. Are you ready? Lord Jesus, I feel like now and at times you have looked at me and been disappointed. I feel like when you stare at me, I should not be even looked upon because what a sinner am I. But God, I've heard your message of amazing grace, how you called even the tax collector. And so God, I invite you to call into my heart and rescue me. I want to be one of your comeback stories. So come, and as you're knocking at my heart's door, help me answer. And right now, Jesus, I invite you in for your name's sake and your glory. From now on, I want to follow you, Jesus. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we pray. In the name of God the Father Almighty, who says, Go!